Hi everyone, my name is Julia from Lovells YA and today I have the honour of talking to Jodie McAllister about her brilliant new book, Libby Lawrence is Good at Pretending, uh, which I really loved and I hope everyone else does too. Uh, to kick us off, Jodie, can you tell me uh, what is Libby Lawrence all about? Libby Lawrence is about theatre kids with too many emotions. Uh, so it is set in a university theatre group and our heroine Libby has for the first time managed to get the lead role in one of their productions. Uh, but she's struggling more and more and more with being able to articulate her feelings. So she's very good at acting. So, she, you know, that's quite a handy skill. Uh, but her real journey throughout the book is learning how to say what she wants and to admit the things that she's done that she's maybe not so proud of. Amazing. So what made you decide to write a book all about theatre kids? So I once was a theatre kid, once upon a time, as <laughs> will be so surprising to anyone who's ever met me, <laughs> my goodness. But I actually wrote the first draft of this book when I was a theatre kid. I wrote yeah. the first draft of this book when I was 20 and I was at university. And so in this book, Libby is 19 and she's a second year undergrad. I wrote the first draft when I was 20 and a third year undergrad. So right about the same age that Libby is. Obviously, in the interim, I have rewritten and redrafted this book a lot. I've rewritten it from the ground up four times. This wow. is a, a story that I have always wanted to be able to tell, but perhaps didn't quite know how to tell. I had to, I had to learn how you write a book, and this book taught me how to write a book. Um, but there's some of my most uh, beloved and like intensely emotional memories being in theatre. It's a it's a real pressure cooker where emotions are like jacked up to to 20 out of 10. And so I always knew I wanted to write about theatre. I just had to learn to write first, it turns out. Yeah, wow. Um, because you've published three novels before Libby Lawrence. Uh, the Valentine series, which are obviously uh, a fantasy series. So, and this is your contemporary debut. So uh, I guess why the switch to contemporary and what do you like about writing contemporary? Uh, so when I, well, I suppose I started in writing contemporary, switched over to writing Valentine and then returned to this book. Like I, the way my writing career has worked basically is that I drafted the B, and then I set it aside and I wrote Valentine. And then I redrafted Libby. And then I redrafted Valentine. And then I redrafted Libby. And then I sold Valentine. And I was like, oh, I've now got to write the other two books in this series. And then once that was done, I came back and I redrafted Libby again. And fourth time was the charm. Um, but I foolishly thought writing contemporary. Uh, I was like, oh, I don't have to do any world building this time. I don't have to invent the rules of fantasy. And that was foolish because it was harder in Libby Lawrence. Um, there you go. I, I, really like, I really like writing fantasy because you can make the stakes life or death and that can be very, very believable. Mm. Um, and that allows you to cheat a little bit emotionally sometimes, I think, where you're like, okay, the emotions are also intense because everyone is about to die. So, of course, they're making these grand proclamations. Uh, when the stakes are some people are putting on a play, um, that is a little bit harder. You can re you rely less on kind of external motivators and external situational factors. And you have to really think about the psychology of the characters. And that was one thing I've always loved about, write about writing this book is how deeply I could think through uh, Libby and what makes her tick. And not just Libby, who's our perspective character, but also... Will and Ella and Rock and Nightingale and all the, the background characters in this book, really getting into their heads and working out why they are the way they are, because a lot of the drama in this book comes from the internal rather than the external. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think that's a really great insight into how, you know, from a reader's perspective, it can seem really simple. You publish three fantasy novels, then you publish a contemporary, when in reality, it's so much more interwoven and you, the ideas are flowing, you're working on everything at once, and this is just how we see it from the other side. Um, yeah. yeah, speaking like, of those I, really... I never would have guessed that Valentine would be my first book. I always thought it was going to be this one. There you go, and I'm glad we got it in the end. <laughs> um, <laughs> Me too. 
but yeah, speaking of those intense emotions and how that's so much more of a driver for a contemporary novel, uh, I really loved that part of the book, the fact that the characters feel so deeply and not only, but as a reader, I felt like I was really there with them uh, and it was really easy to sort of put myself in their shoes and to feel everything that was going on. So I was wondering if you have any writing advice for how on earth does a, a young writer approach trying to uh, give their characters motivations and explore their, their intense emotions? Yeah, uh, I think the, the first trick I can give you is to not get intimidated by the word motivation. I think because this word is used a lot in writing circles, people often get a little bit scared of it. And they think that a motivation has to be like a grand scheme or a grand plan. And that if your character is not planning to take over the world, then like motivation, question mark. But all motivation is, is what does your character want? And often when you're younger in particular, uh, you don't quite know how to articulate what you want. And that's actually kind of at the core of Libby's journey in this book is that she will not admit to herself what she wants. And so of course she can't articulate it and learning how to, to put into words the things that she feels and the things that she desires, that is the maturation process for her over the course of the book. We talk about young adult and new adult as coming of age a lot of the time. That's her coming of age journey is being able to articulate what, what she wants. And so of course this is difficult for young writers because often you haven't got that skill yet to work out what you want. So if you can figure that out, if you can just identify what your character wants, even if it is a little thing, then that will set you on a track for a long piece of work. Um, but also work it out scene by scene. Sometimes your character's motivation in a scene might be, I really want a cup of coffee. Like it doesn't have to be super complicated. But rather than just kind of having people milling around and smashing them together like Ken and Barbie dolls, if you can work out what they want, that writing process will come a lot easier. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so talking about characters, uh, another thing I really loved about the book is uh, most of the story is from Libby's point of view. She's very much the main character. But uh, I really loved the little interludes in the book. So there are these little scenes where we get um, little sneak peeks into the heads of the other characters. So what was the process like behind deciding to expand the story from Libby's point of view? So those interludes have been in the book since that very first draft when I was 20 years old. The structure has always remained the same. And probably of all the writing in the book, the most of 20 year old Jody is preserved in those interludes, particularly with Rock and Ella, but also to an extent with Will and Nightingale. Um, originally I conceived of the idea because I was being a little bit wanky and I wanted to give the book a five act structure like a Shakespeare play because they they put on much ado about nothing over the course of this uh of this book and I was like oh what if I who I think I was taking an Elizabethan theatre course at the time in, in undergrad as well and I was like oh I can show that I know they've got five acts in them and this will allow me to break them up but they've become some of my favourite parts of the book. And I think they're some of the strongest writing in there, to be honest, even though it is 20 year old Jody in many places, um, because they just allow you this like quick snapshot into what other people are thinking and feeling. And it doesn't, all, like a lot of it is stuff Libby doesn't know. So it is a, a technique in many places called dramatic irony, uh, appropriate <laughs> for uh, a book so wound up with drama like this. Uh, but I think it allows us a fuller understanding of the world because community theatre is all about community. So we have to get some community perspective. Oh, I love that. Uh, yeah, I, it's interesting to hear that you think some of those scenes are your best writing because I definitely found myself looking forward to them and, you know, trying to guess who was coming next. And <laughs> like you say, there are some, uh, because you're, getting things from a different point of view. There are things that Libby doesn't know and there are definitely some reveals and surprises uh, that obviously I'm not going to spoil, but uh, hopefully readers gasp the way that I did. Uh, I will tell you the hardest one to write was Nightingales. That one Really, was... that's so interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I think you did a great job because I loved reading that interlude and I think it fits, it fit really well with what we learned about him up until that point. And yeah, I guess what happened with him afterwards. 
Uh, but yeah, like you mentioned, the book centers around uh, the characters putting on a production of Much Do About Nothing. So uh, why Much Do About Nothing? Why, of all of Shakespeare's plays, of all the plays out there, did you choose Much Ado to kind of feature as the backbone of this book? So there is a simple answer and a, co and a more complicated answer. The simple answer is I love Much Ado About <laughs> Nothing. It's my favourite Shakespeare play. Um, like realistically that was the motivation when 20 year old Jodie sat it's always been much to do about nothing it's never yeah. been anything else. when I sat down to write this book I was like hmm, I a 20 year old community theater kid what is my dream role oh it's Beatrice and much to do about nothing guess that's what Libby's gonna get to do so like from 20 year old Jodie's perspective there is a little bit of wish fulfillment there um but the reason I love Much Ado About Nothing, which I've been able to articulate to myself as I as I got older, and also because I'm also an academic, like I study literature and you know reading kind of theory around this area, I've been like, oh, that's why that one always sat well with me. Is um, there's this theory from the feminist scholar Carla Kaplan called the erotics of talk, and it argues that uh, very often, like female viewers and readers and consumers of texts. Uh, and characters in these texts are in the hunt for an ideal listener, someone who will uh, be able to hear what they're saying, will actually listen to it, will take it on board, and will react in an appropriate way. And within Much Ado About Nothing, that's what Beatrice and Benedict are to each other, I think. Like, they fight all the time, but they love to fight. Like, <laughs> fighting is sex to them in many ways. <laughs> But then when things get serious towards act four of the play with the whole like failed marriage of Hero and Claudio, when Beatrice really needs someone to listen to what she's feeling and do something about it, it's Benedict who does that. He's able to listen, even though he doesn't necessarily have the same opinion, he listens, he takes it seriously, he takes it on board and he does something about it. Even though it means like potentially challenging his best friend to a duel, like big, big consequences. And so Libby, Libby, Libby Lawrence isn't uh, like retelling of Much Ado About Nothing. It's very much the play that they're putting on. But that dynamic between Libby and Will, which, spoilers, that's the slow burn romance of the book, they also have that erotics of talk dynamic where they are each other's ideal listener. And that's what Libby finds in Will that she hasn't really been able to find with anyone else is that he listens to what she says. And there's something very calming very relieving and very steadying about that absolutely uh and i think what you say about the libby lawrence not being a retelling of much ado uh i definitely uh agree with but i think the thing i love about it is that libby lawrence takes maybe some of the themes of much ado and kind of respins them and tells them in a new setting and a new story which i think um really complements the staging of Much Ado and what's going on in Libby's personal life. And yeah, I find that's always a really great balance for a story. I thought retelling Much Ado while they're putting on Much Ado, that would be too many like Russian. That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Well, it's been really great to hear from you. Just to finish up our conversation, uh, we can end on what would you like readers to take away from reading Libby Lawrence? Uh, well, first, I want readers to know that they don't have to be a theatre kid to read this book. I think uh, even if you have never set foot in a theatre in your life, I think there is something in, in there for you because that, that idea of learning how to be able to articulate what you want, I think that is an experience that everyone goes through. Absolutely. And that's also what I hope people get out of it as well, that there is a value to being able to put into words what you want and that when you can do that, you'll probably find someone who's willing to listen to it. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for speaking to me, Jodie, and I hope everyone else loves Libby Lawrence as much as I did. <laughs>